All right, cool. Recording has started. Welcome to section everybody. Uh, today is section five. Uh, we're going to be talking about trees today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Just want to make sure. Awesome. Got some thumbs up reacts. Thank you for that. So let's go ahead and get started with the slideshow. All right. So we're going to be talking about AVL trees and heaps. Um, heaps are basically just priority queues, and uh, they look like trees. Um, tons of trees today. And a little funny meme here. When you ro rotate the AVL tree once but still isn't balanced, you can do it again. You keep on doing it. And if this doesn't make sense, it's going to make sense by the end of this section. Cool. So first, let's talk about AVL trees and BSTs, uh, binary search trees, more generally. So let's review what a BST is. So a BST is short for binary search tree. And why is it called binary? It's because every single leaf in the tree has two leaves, so two children. So for example, this um, overall root, this root of this tree right here has two children, one going left, one going right. That's why it's called binary. And why is it called a search tree? It's a search tree because it's organized such that it's really easy to uh, kind of traverse and search for um, the exact thing that you want to search for. So for instance, if I want to see if the number 12 exists in this tree, I would first start at the base, so 10. And then I would say, all right, my number is 12. That's bigger than 10. So I'm going to go right. So all numbers to the right of each leaf are going to be bigger than the, leaf, than the current leaf. Uh, or the current tree. Um, and all numbers to the left are going to be smaller. Um, sorry, I think I got my terms mixed up. I think I said leaf. I think I meant node. So at each node, if you go left, the node is going, all nodes are going to be smaller. If you go right, all nodes are going to get bigger. So if I'm looking for a number 12, I would go right. Now I'm on this node with number 15. And I know 12 is smaller than 15, so I know I have to go left. And here we go. We found 12. So that's how binary search trees are uh, ordered. Everything to the left of a node is smaller. Everything to the right is bigger. So if you're looking for a number that's smaller, go left. Looking for something that's bigger, go right. Any questions about that at all? OK, so let's talk about some problems with this. So uh, you know, looking at BSTs, this is a super cool, super clean data structure. Um, makes sense why we structure it the way it is. What could go wrong? One problem that might arise is BSTs can become unbalanced. So find is slow. So if we look at this example of a binary search tree, this is still considered a binary search tree. But the issue is, it's in the form of a linked list, essentially, because we, have to, we only have one link going to the left. It only goes down one way. So if there are n elements in your tree, and each node is only connected uh, by the left child, then if you were to like say try to find the value five, you would have to keep going left and essentially traverse all of the elements inside the tree. So find is slow. In the worst case, it's going to run in O of n time, linear time, because in the worst case, it's a linked list. So you'll have to loop through the entire linked list to find the um, lowest value or highest value if you're on the other side. So let's talk about like what balance means. So we know what unbalanced means. Unbalanced means like all of the nodes are kind of like on one side. So let's talk about what it means to be balanced. The definition of balance is for every node, we compare the heights of its two subtrees. And if it's balanced, the difference between the heights is no greater than one for every single node. So that's the invariant. 
where invariant is something that has to remain true. So let's take a look at this balance tree example. So to kind of first begin, what we do is uh, we can start at maybe the base level or uh, level, uh, the bottom level. So seven, it has no children. So its height is just going to be like uh, zero. And same with nine, the height is going to be zero. So if we look at the node eight, who has children's seven and nine, we compare the heights of seven and nine. And we just found out the height is just going to be zero or one, depending on how you want to count it. And since the heights of the trees are not, uh, the difference is not greater than one, this is a balanced tree. And let's take a look at this tree. This middle tree is unbalanced. Why is it unbalanced? It's because this node that has value 10 it has a left child. Um, so yeah, this is going to be of height zero. Uh, so these would be of height ones um, when we talk about these, this balance tree on the left. So this tree on the left side has height zero, but the tree on the right-hand side that holds uh, the value 15 has a height of two. So it has one node here, and then the 15 node itself is another height. So on the left-hand side of the uh, node 10, you have um, height equals zero right here. But right here, you have a height of two. So since the difference between zero and two is greater than one, this is an unbalanced tree. And here's a couple more examples. This ex example here is a balanced tree. Now you may be asking, why is it balanced? Well. Our definition is no greater than one. So on the left-hand side of the node eight, the height is one. On the right-hand side, it's zero. So the difference is one, which isn't greater than one. So this is still considered a balanced tree. And then similarly for a tree with just one single node, both heights on the left and right are zero, which still satisfies this invariant. Any questions about uh, balanced or unbalanced trees? All right. Moving on. Now, let's talk about some um, kind of facts about trees. So note, a balanced tree with n items has a height of O log n. So that means the height is going to be given by the function log n. Now, why is that? The reason is, is because um, this is a binary tree, right? So at each level, we know that the number of nodes is going to double at each level. So for instance, um, if you start with like a single node, and this is a balanced tree, then it's going to kind of like look like this. And then as you keep on growing out, since you're growing by a factor of two at each step, If you take this function log n, then you'll get the height. So that's just some math behind it. Um, for example, this is a height of 7. Log base 2 of 7 is going to get roughly give you 3 after some rounding. So the reason the height is log n is precisely because we are uh, doubling the number of nodes at each level with some additional rounding, of course. So this is going to be a very useful fact for us. Now, we just talked about how BSTs can become unbalanced. And we just defined what it means to be balanced. And we also know that the height of a balanced tree is log n. 
So to get from the very top to the very bottom level, we'll just take log n operations. So we need a solution. We need to figure out how we can keep our BST balanced. And the solution is in AVL trees. AVL trees are sometimes called BBSTs, um, balanced binary search trees. Um, we call them AVL trees, but they're essentially just um, a special BST. So it's a superset of a BST that remains uh, balanced no matter what order the items are inserted in. And this we do this by rebalancing themselves using rotations. So AVL trees are just like BS, uh, binary search trees, but they become a little bit more complicated in their operations. With binary search trees, when you do uh, insertion, we just insert wherever it is supposed to go. So for example, in this example, we insert 10, we build out this node, we insert 9. 9 is less than 10, we build out this node. 7 is less than 9, we build out this node. And we just build in whatever order um, it's supposed to go in. It doesn't do any like rebalancing. It doesn't modify the original tree. 10 is always going to be at the root. Contrary, AVL trees do rebalance and they do change. However, the invariant that everything to the left is smaller and everything to the right is bigger still holds true. So AVL trees are just special BSCs that rebalance themselves using series of rotations each time an item gets inserted. So um, there's different cases in which how this happens. So in this example, so in this example right here, we can just do this in one rotation. So what happens is the parent's left becomes the child's right, child's right becomes his parent. If you're a visual learner like me, I have no idea what this means. So let's draw this out. So essentially, we know this is an unbalanced tree because looking at the node that has value 3, the left tree has a height of 2, right tree has a height of 0. So we know it's unbalanced. But it's still a binary search tree because everything to the left is smaller, everything to the right is bigger or no. So the way we re rebalance this is we're like, OK, two, we want to bring this up. And then we want two to point to three. And then two to point to one on the left-hand side. So now we have a balanced tree where the invariant still holds that everything to the left is smaller, everything to the right is bigger. So we're doing kind of like a small rotation so essentially, we're flipping this arrow right here. And then after flipping that arrow, it looks like this. So that's going to be a right rotation, because you're kind of rotating everything to the right. You're moving two up and three down. And similarly, um, you might encounter a situation like this. But instead of rotating right, we rotate left. Um, so we move this arrow such that we flip it like so. But the picture will still be the same as this. So it's super, super cool, super, super powerful, super powerful. And another case you might run, run into is um, the kink case. So not sure why it's called the kink case, um, but um, this involves two rotations. So first, you rotate the subtree right, and then you rotate the root tree left. So what that is ki will kind of look like is um, essentially what you're doing is, let's see, you are going to point this, remove this pointer there, and then, wait, actually, hold on. This is always like a little bit of a tricky one. Rotate the subtree right. Okay. 
Oh, right. So you're going to remove this pointer. So three is no. Actually, hold on, let me think about this real quick. So essentially, you're going to take the two, and then you're going to want to point it to the parent. So one, and then you're going to want to point the two to the three. So with this solution, you're going to actually have two rotations. So with a line case, you just have to rotate, do one rotation. And by rotation, we essentially mean just changing one of the links. So right here, we change the link from two pointing to nothing to two pointing to this three. We just have to do that one, one time. But whenever you have like a kick case where it goes like kind of like right and then left or left and then right, it requires two rotations that kind of look like this. So two is going to point to the parent. So the overall root right here. And th uh, two is going to also point to this um, bigger value. But essentially, you want the middle value to kind of like move up a level. And then similarly, it's the same thing for this one, but kind of like opposite. Um, but yeah, so you want to point to one and then to point to three. And these are pretty tricky to grasp. Uh, I got a chat. So that chat rotates right move two to the three three to the lowest node after rotate the shape is similar to second then rotate left yeah i believe you're right uh yuan chow and so rotations get a little bit tricky but luckily we do have slides for that so we have a avl rotation walkthrough I won't go over this too in depth because there's like a lot of slides in here, but you can find these slides on our course website. And um, this will help you kind of like visualize what we should do for each of the problems in terms of rotations. So I highly recommend checking these slides out um, if you are trying to like better understand AVO tree rotations. So great resource right here. Check out the section uh, slides for that. Going back to our slides, now that we kind of like talked about BSTs and AVL trees, let's go over some of the um, problems from um, the section handout. So what we're going to be working on is questions 1A to 1C. And these have to do with determining if a tree is valid, um, is a valid BS tree or a AVL tree. So I don't think I'll break you all out into breakout rooms because there's not too many questions here. Um, so I'll have you all think about it for maybe like three or so minutes. Um, look through these trees, try to determine if they're valid uh, binary search trees. And if they are, determine if they are a valid AVL tree. And then let's come back together and talk about why they are BST trees, why they are AVL trees, or not. So I'll give you all a couple minutes to work through it and think about it, and we'll come right back. All right, and we are back. So let's talk about these problems. So problem 1A, valid BSD. Is this a valid binary search tree, everyone? What do y'all think? No, no. Yeah, I got a couple of no's. Um, can someone who said no or thinks no tell me why this isn't a BST? Feel free to like unmute or drop something in the chat. Awesome, yeah, because two need to be the left of six. Uh, yes. So yeah, two is part of it. So remember the invariance for binary search trees is that all nodes for every single node, 
all nodes to the left are smaller, all nodes to the right are bigger. However, in this case, two goes to the right first, and then it goes left. But two has to, whenever we insert two, it has to go left. So there's no way for two to end up on this side right here. Since two is on the right side of seven and two is uh, smaller than seven, that breaks the, the rule, that breaks the invariant. So this is not a valid BST. And Sukhwinder, you're right. Um, two needs to be to the left of six. So two does not go here. It goes over here. Awesome. Anyone have questions about uh, this problem? All right. So now that we know it's a not a binary search tree, is it a valid AVL tree? Any ideas? Is it a valid AVL? I see in yes, no, 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 no. Yep. Um, or I guess the answer is uh, yes, it's no. Um, it must be a binary search tree to be an AVL tree. Remember, AVL trees are binary search trees, except it has the constraint that it's balanced. So we know that if it is an AVL tree, then it has to be a binary search tree. Um, so since this is not a binary search tree, it can't possibly be an AVL tree. Because an AVL tree is just a BST with more restrictions. So since it's not even a BST, um, there's no way for it to be an AVL tree. Any questions about this? All right. All right. All right. This one looks a little bit more complicated. So we have 43, 7, 59, et cetera, et cetera. Is this a valid BST? Any thoughts? All right. No. Yes. Any other thoughts? No. 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 All right. Um, can someone who said no tell me why they think it's no? Not balanced. So the key part to this problem is we're asking if it's a valid binary search tree. We're not asking if it's a valid um, AVL tree. So the answer to this is actually, yes, it is a BST. So remember, the only requirement for it to be a binary search tree is that everything to the left is smaller, everything to the right is bigger. So if you see here, uh, for every single node, its left child is smaller and its right child is bigger. So this is actually a binary search tree. So if you're searching for like 42, you would go left, seven, go right, and we found 42. And as you can see, for every single one of these nodes, all the values to the right of 43 are bigger than 43. All the values to the left of 43 are smaller than 43. And same goes with all these other values. All the values to the right of seven are bigger than seven. All the values to the left of seven is smaller than seven, etc. So this is a binary search tree. Now, is this an AVL tree? I think some of you got it. Um, it is not an AVL tree because it's not balanced. So just to reiterate, it is a BS uh, binary search tree because it follows the rule that all the nodes to the left are smaller, all the nodes to the right are bigger. This is true for every single node, but it's not an AVL tree because it's only an AVL tree that cares about um, balance. In this case, 42 violates the balance condition. Why? It's because 42 
um, it has a height of uh, three, because one, two, three. But six, this has a, a height of one. So since the difference between three and one is greater than one, 42 makes it unbalanced. So anyone have an idea of how we would kind of make this balanced? We'd have to do some rotations, right? So the way we rotate this is um, we would first point 21 to uh, 42. And then 21 would point to 11. And then this doesn't point to anything. And then 7 would point to 21. All right, that's super messy. But essentially, after doing some rotations, it is going to kind of look like this. So you have 21, 42. Then you have 11. And then 7 would point to 21. And that's how you would make this tree balanced. And why is it balanced? It's because this subtree has height 2, and 6 has height 1. The difference is now 1 instead of 2. So that is what's going to help us make it balanced. Cool. Any questions about this problem? All right, cool. So about 1C, is this a BST? Yes, yes, yes. Yep, y'all would be correct. It is a BST. Yes, a big yes from Cindy. Is this an AVL tree? Yes, yes, yes. Yep, this is an AVL tree. And uh, if you noticed, this is actually the rotated version of the 1B. So this is actually the exact same tree as this invalid AVL tree, except we did that um, rotation that uh, we just went over. After rotating, um, after making 20, moving 21 up here and 42 down as a child of 21. After doing this rotation, it fulfills the AVL invariant. So it is an AVL tree. So cool. So just to re reiterate that point one more time, BST, the rule is, Everything to the left is smaller. Everything to the right is bigger for every single uh, node. And AVL tree, that invariant is still true. But we are also adding the rule that it is balanced, meaning the height of any two subtrees of a particular node have to have a height within one. So the difference in their heights can't be greater than one. So just think of an AVL as a stricter BST. And BST is not really strict. In the worst case, it can be a linked list. Now, let's go over problems 5A to C. AVL, uh, big O. So um, actually, before we start um, kind of talking about this, why don't y'all look through the uh, problems on your own? And then let's come back and uh, talk about it together as a class. So we're going to stop sharing, pause the recording. All right, and we're back. So let's go ahead and do these problems together. Now, big O. Write down a tight big O for each of the following. Unless otherwise noted, give a bound in the worst case. Insert and find in a BST. So remember that we're considering the worst case. Um, and just to reiterate, a worst case for a BST is just a linked list, where all the nodes are just on one side. 
So in terms of insertion and find, what is that worst case runtime? What do you all think? N, O, N, log N. All right. So for insertion and find, if we think about it, let's say you have like a linked list or not a linked list, a BST that kind of, I guess it is a linked list, but let's see, we have something like this, like, uh, I don't know, four, three, two, and one. Let's say we wanted to run an insertion and we want to insert zero. In order to do that, since it's a linked list, we have to traverse through the entire linked list, right? We have to go bsd.left, 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 .left, 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 and then finally we can insert zero. And similarly, if we wanted to find zero after inserting it, we remember, we always have to start at the root, so we have to traverse down the entire tree. So since we have to traverse through all the elements in the worst case, it's going to be O of n. And the reason is um, insertion, we have to go all the way to the bottom of the tree, which is the end of the linked list. So we have to traverse through all the nodes. And similarly, finding the biggest and smallest item in the skewed binary tree, to find the last item, you have to loop through the entire binary search tree, all the elements in there. So that's why the worst case runtime is going to be O of n. And that's for a binary search tree. What about for an AVL tree? What's the worst case runtime for uh, insertion and find? All right, getting lots of logins. And yep, y'all are correct. So remember, one added benefit of re uh, keeping balanced is that we know the um, it's not going to be skewed. The tree isn't going to be skewed. It's going to be balanced. So the difference in height between every single uh, node is going to be less than um, or equal to one. And like we kind of like talked about when we first talked about AVL trees, we talked about how the height of a AVL tree is log n. So to get from the very top to the very bottom, we'll just take log n time. So since to get from the top to the worst case, which is the very bottom of the tree, just takes log n time, then the worst case runtime is also a log n. And this is all thanks to the tree being balanced. Anyone have any questions about this or questions about where we got log n from? All right. Now let's talk about this. So how about finding the minimum value in an AVL tree containing n elements? What's the worst case for this one? All right, log n. Yep, log n. And for this worst case, in terms of like um, finding the smallest value, all you have to do is just keep on traversing left because we know that if we keep on going left, we're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So to find the smallest element, you just keep on going left until you reach a leaf node. And that leaf node is going to be the uh, smallest minimum value. So yeah. And with the same logic, you can find the uh, maximum value in an AVL tree uh, the same way, except you just keep on going right. So now that we've kind of talked about, um, this brings up an interesting point, right? Finding the minimum value and finding the maximum value. Now let's kind of talk about um, analyzing dictionary implementations. And then we'll talk about minimizing and uh, maximizing and how to make that even faster. 
So what are the constraints on the data types you can store in an AVL tree? So the constraints on the data types you can store in an AVL tree is that they have to be comparable. Now, why does it have to be comparable? It's because AVL trees maintain its ordering and balance based on some sort of sorted order, right? We know that in AVL trees and BS uh, binary search trees more broadly are defined by um, everything to the left is smaller, everything to the right is bigger. So you need some way to compare values. So that's the constraint whenever you store things in an AVL tree or binary search trees you need a way for them to be comparable. So values have to be comparable. That's why when you use tree maps in um, Java, you need the value that that tree map holds has to be comparable. The keys have to be compar uh, implement comparable. Now, when is using an AVL tree preferred over a hash table? Um, AVL trees are preferred over a hash table. Um, in this case, where um, if you're calling like get, um, AVL trees guarantee O log n at all times. This is the worst case if you're trying to retrieve a certain key. But hash table in the worst case, where every key is added to the same bucket, like so, let's say all of these hash, and then we take the index of that, they all map to index one. Um, the worst case is it's a linked list. So it takes O n time. So has a better worst case. But one caveat to this is that in practice, if you have a really good hash function, then you won't run into the issue with all of these, um, I guess, key values hashing and mapping to the exact same index. In practice, this normally won't happen. But hypothetically, in the worst case, um, maps have a worse uh, runtime than the worst case AVL trees. Could we use hash codes for AVL comparison? Um, you can, but I don't see a reason that you would because the purpose of um, AVL trees is to help you find things in uh, sorted order. So for example, um, let's say instead of the AVL trees um, storing like, integers, let's say the AVL trees store strings, right? Strings, if you take the hash code of that, like um, Apple, which comes like um, earlier on in the uh, alphabetically than banana, um, its hash code might be bigger than the hash code for banana. And since um, if we use the hash codes for comparison, then we're going to say that Apple come is bigger or comes after banana, which isn't necessarily true. So while we technically can use hash codes for AVL tree comparison, um, there's really no reason that you would. Yeah, that's a great question though. Now let's talk about problem 6C. When is using a BST preferred over an AVL tree? So the main reason is that BSTs are just a lot easier to implement and debug. Like BST trees, it only has like one or I guess two simple invariants. Everything to the left is smaller. Everything to the right is bigger. It doesn't have to worry about like rotating. It doesn't have to worry about being balanced. BSTs are just way easier to implement and debug. Now let's talk about heaps. So with AVL trees, uh, we left off kind of like talking about in problem 5C, talking about like um, thinking about getting the minimum value and maximum value and how we would like travel all the way to the left or all the way to the right, where the worst case runtime is log n. What if you wanted a data structure that gets you the minimum or gets you the maximum number in constant time? Can we do that? And the answer is, Yes, potentially. And the answer of, lies within heaps. Um, as I talked about in the beginning of uh, this section, heaps are basically just priority queues. Maybe y'all have used that before, but priority queues are just like queues, except um, instead of just um, removing an insertion order, 
we remove based on a certain priority value. Where if you're dealing with like a minimum heap, um, every node smaller than equal to its children, um, or the value at the front or at the very overall root of the tree is going to be the minimum. If it's a max heap, then the overall root at the um, tree is going to be the maximum value. In this case, this is a min, uh, min heap. Every node is smaller than or equal to its children. Um, so this is the new invariant. And the node at the very overall root, that's going to be either the maximum if you're using a max heap or the minimum if you're using a min heap. So as you can see, this min heap, um, the invariant here is that every node is smaller than or equal to its children. So if we look at the, the node two, right? Two is smaller than all of its children. It's smaller than nine, four, seven. Likewise, three is smaller than six and five. And one is smaller than both one and three. And if it's a max heap, then um, every single node has to be bigger than all its children. So this is the new invariant that you'll have to remember. Now, what is heap? Let's go over the following operations you would use for heap. Um, you would use either remove min or remove max, basically, uh, for the most part, um, which removes the roots of the tree for the min or max heap. So for example, if you wanted to remove the minimum of a min heap, you can just remove the very top element, because we know that this has to be the smallest element. And remove max, same reasoning, except we'll be removing the maximum number. And we're going to do something called percolating up or down, similar to like rotating in a way with AVL trees, um, in order to fix the heap after insert or remove. And we do this through swaps. So similar to how um, when we insert or uh, remove from the AVL tree, we might have to modify the structure of the tree. Um, heaps are the same way in that you have to modify the structure of the tree after doing like insertions and removals. So what does that look like? So um, what this looks like is, let's say we insert seven. So there's no animations for these slides, but essentially what we did is whenever you insert in a heap, you want to insert at the next available slot. And what do I mean by the next available slot? Um, think about it as going up um, from up, down, left, right. So we have 2, 3, 5, 4, 17, 6, and 13. And notice how it's like complete, right? It's filled from top down to and then left to right. Whenever we insert, we always want to add at the next available spot. So in this case, the next available spot is going to be to the left of 17. And now the heap is broken, so we percolate up. So in order to do that, you just move, you just swap seven with its parent, and then see if it still um, is in the correct order. If it still like um, kind of maintains the correct rule, uh, maintains the invariance, and then you keep on percolating up if it doesn't. So seven would swap with seventeen, and then check if that violates the invariant at all. If it doesn't, then you're good. And remove min. So again, sorry that these slides don't have any like clean animations, but remove min, we just remove the minimum element in the um, heap. So we need to replace it with something. And the trick with heaps is you actually going to replace it with the bottom value, so or the very last value. So we would place seven up here. But this doesn't this violates the invariant that all nodes. Uh, all the children of the node is smaller, right? So now you would do what's called percolate down, and you would move seven down uh, to one of the uh, children levels until your invariant uh, holds. So you would percolate down, move seven again. You just move seven up to the root, and you percolate down. All right, so um, I think I'll go over like what that kind of looks like. So percolate down is you just kind of like swap seven um, with one of its children, 
So in this case, let's swap seven with five. And this is going to be seven. And that still violates the rule. So you're going to swap seven with six. Now this becomes six. And now five still violates the rule. So you want to swap. Um, actually, I think it should. Actually, yeah. Now you would swap five with two. And then you keep on doing this until um, your tree matches uh, or meets the invariant. It doesn't violate the invariant. You keep on swapping five down um, and then until you uh, don't violate the invariant and all the children of every single node is smaller than the node. And then we'll see some examples of that um, in uh, these slides going forward. So now you might be thinking, all right, how do we like represent this heap or this tree as a data structure? What we do is we actually represent it using an array. Yeah, that's a little bit trippy because this is a tree. How the, how the heck do you represent this as an array? Well, the way you would uh, represent this as an array is you read from uh, top to bottom, left to right. So here's an example with array starting at index 0. So uh, or index one. So the root element of the tree of the heap is going to be put at index one, and then you put in 54, and then you put in three. So all you're doing is reading from top to bottom, left to right, and inserting into this array. So one, um, maybe draw this out. So one, next number is 54, next number is three, then next number is 94, next number is 62 and so on. So you read the heap from top down, left to right. And you do some pretty cool math tricks in order to kind of like get the indices of a uh, node's left child and right child. So to get the left child at i, if you're starting at array index 1, you just multiply 2 times i. And to get the right child, you do 2 times i plus 1. Now, why does that work? It's because if you look, consider the node 1, it's at index 1, right? So to get the left child, you just do 2 times i, which is 1, and which is 2, sorry. So you know that the left child is at index 2. And as you can see, the left child is 54, and the left child is at index 2. And to get the right, right child, just add 1 to that. And this actually is going to work for every single one of these nodes. So let's pick 94 arbitrarily, maybe. So 94, we know it's at index 4. Uh, to get the left child, you just do 2 times 4, which is 8. So its child is 96. And precisely, it's 96. And if you add 1, then you'll just get the right child. So using this pretty clever uh, math tricks, you can get the children and parents of any single one of these nodes. And if you start at index 0 in your array, so the only thing difference between this one and this one is for this implementation, we leave index 0 empty. Um, makes our math a little bit easier. But if you want to start index 0, then you would do like left child 2i plus 1, 2i plus 2, and then i minus 1 in the parent instead of just i. Uh, so two different implementations um, with starting at index 1, the math is a little bit cleaner looking, a little bit easier uh, than starting at index 0. But both of them work, and functionally, they're the same. And the reason that this array implementation works is because this tree is complete. Now, what do I mean by complete? That means as we're going from left to right, uh, left to right, top from bottom, we're not missing any nodes. So for example, if we were missing this node right here, so like 62's left child was uh, null, then this would no longer be a complete tree, and we wouldn't be able to uh, represent this as a heap. So complete trees are trees that are like uh, completely filled 
when you go from top down, left, right. But since we're missing a node right here, if we are missing a node, then this wouldn't be a complete tree. The reason all this math works is because, and that we can represent this using array, is because we can make the assumption that heaps represent a complete tree. All right. Now, let's talk about ternary heaps. So ternary heaps are just like heaps, except um, instead of each node having two children, each node has three children. So what does that look like? So let's visualize what this uh, three or ternary heap looks like. So we insert five, and we know five has three children. So we insert the next one, 20, insert 10, insert 6. Our invariant still holds because all the children of 5 are bigger than it. So 5 is smaller than its children. Now we insert 7. We put 7 right here. And notice how we put 7 at the next available spot right here, right? And this is because it's a complete tree, because this is the next place to put a new node. We don't follow the same rules as like AVL trees or BS trees where um, we go left if it's smaller, right if it's bigger. Heaps don't have that sort of ordering. You just put it at the next available spot. And since this actually violates the uh, invariant that every no, every children is smaller or every children is bigger, we're actually going to do a swap right here. So we're like, what the heck? This is incorrect. So all we have to do is swap 7 and 20. That's what percolate means. It just means swap. And then that's all we have to do. And similarly, when we insert 3, 3 puts in the next available spot. Um, 3 needs to percolate up, so it just swaps with 7. And we keep on doing this. And sometimes you might have to keep on percolating up. But finally, we reach this um, representation. So how do we represent this as an array? Well, first, again, we just read from top to bottom, left to right. So first, we're going to put in 1. And depending on whether we want to start at index 0 or 1, we put 1 either right here or right here. Next, we look at the next value, 3, put it in, put in 2, put in 6 and so on. And these next couple slides will help us visualize that. Put in 1, put in 3, 2, 6, and just put it in order. Cool. And so that's the end of section. Um, but these next few slides kind of like go into figuring out how to determine a any node's parents and any node's children. And that involves a little bit of math. But the cool thing is there's actually a pattern to it. Like the math for finding the parent of a binary heap is very similar to the math in, um, that can be used to determine the parent of a ternary heap. Um, for example, for a binary heap, you divide by 2. But for a ternary heap, you divide by 3. And for children, it's very, very similar. So. That's all the time that we have for section today. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. And uh, section recording is going to be posted by tomorrow afternoon.